Welcome to the DHSPA virtual college panel. Um, I'm Antoinette Coles, and along with my co-chair, Leela Bakhtun, we welcome you all and thank you for joining us. Um, thank you go to Melissa Williams and Sarah Newman, our program's co-chairs, who collaborated with Megan Emanuelson to bring this event to you and your students. Um, and a few quick reminders. Um, next week, we have our junior planning night on Monday, November 1st, and that will be um, with the Zoom. Um, the event, which is run by the guidance department, will be workshop style, and you can expect links and some more information to be sent out soon. Uh, please look for details in the DPN. Um, and then um, on Thursday, November 4th, the DHSPA is hosting the freshman sophomore parent coffee at 9.30 a.m. in the auditorium. And now we'll turn it over to Megan Emanuelson to begin the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Good evening. My name is Megan Emanuelson. I am the Director of Guidance here at Darien High School. Thank you all for joining us for the annual Fall College Fair. To begin, I must extend a huge thank you to our colleagues in higher ed who are joining us this evening during a most busy time in their offices. So we're so appreciative of sharing your time and your expertise with our families. We know it will provide amazing information and great reassurance as they start to navigate this journey. Um, I would echo Leela and Antoinette's thank you to the DHSPA and in particular, Sarah and Melissa. Um, I take no credit for this evening. They are 100% behind it. They work so hard. It's a lot of organization um, and a lot of reach outs and communication. So very much appreciate the opportunity that this presents for our families. Um, and as we talk about college and post high school, I would be remiss if I did not give a huge special thank you to my amazing team of school counselors at the high school who are working so tirelessly to support kids and families. So thank you to the counselors as well. Um, a quick word about the format for this evening. Um, as you know, we are using a webinar format and due to the large number of families in attendance um, and the limited time we have, we will not be able to take questions live. However, you are welcome to submit questions to the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, the chat will not be open, but please use the Q&A feature. Um, we will try our best to leave time for questions this evening and to address as many of those as we can tonight. But of course, you're always welcome to reach out to your school counselor with any questions that remain unanswered. Um, thank you, Lila, for the reminder about junior planning night. Um, all that information will be um, sent. I'm, I'm purposely waiting a couple of days so that's near the top of your um, email inbox and easily accessible with those links on Monday night. Um, but it's really going to be a wonderful event and we would encourage all juniors and their families to attend. Um, again, this, this evening is being recorded and will be posted. So if for some reason, um, you know, someone who wasn't able to attend, they'll be able to access and also don't feel like you have to take copious notes because it will be available to you to review later. Um, so I'm going to first introduce our panelists and then they will each share some information about each of their institutions with you. We have some prepared questions and then we will try to move on to questions and answer. So without further ado, I'd love to introduce our wonderful panelists. Um, Brandy Samaru is from Indiana University. Kate Timlin from Georgetown University, Emily Petersell from Trinity College, Alec Latang from Central Connecticut State University, and Catherine Desino from Union College. Thank you all again for being here. So to begin, we'd love to hear about each of your schools. And Brandy, can I start with you, please? Absolutely. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so thrilled to be here as we're kind of really wrapping up our fall travel season. So um, we're excited to be here tonight. Um, but my name is Brandy Samaru, and I'm a Senior Assistant Director of Admissions for Indiana University, which is located in Bloomington, Indiana. Um, we are, I will be very quick about this, because you can, we can chat later about IU, but I'll, so I'll be very quick. But um, we are located in Bloomington, Indiana, which is in central Indiana, so about 45 minutes south of Indianapolis, about four hours south of Chicago, so you can kind of envision where we're at. Um, Bloomington, yes, is technically a small town, but it is that true college town type of environment. So very active, very vibrant, it's very welcoming, and it's got a lot going on for our students. So no, you're not moving to the middle of nowhere whenever you come to IU. You're coming to a very active and vibrant institution. Um, we have been around for quite some time, established in 1820, so we do have a huge tradition of excellence and innovation both in and out of the classroom. Um, from nationally recognized academic programs to Division I varsity athletics, all in one of the most beautiful campuses in the country. So we do have that rah-rah school spirit, if that's something you're looking for, 24 varsity men's and women's teams, 
we are an institution where we're divided into 12 different schools. And within those 12 different schools, we have more than 200 majors to choose from. We're also large. So we have more than 35,000 undergraduate students on our campus, all 50 states, 140 different countries. Um, and our average class size is 33. Student to faculty ratio is 18 to one. So we still try to give you some of that traditional experiences. Um, but I'll just turn it over to some of my colleagues right now so that we can get to your questions. Thank you so much. Um, Kate? Hi, everyone. Uh, by way of introduction, my name is Kate Timlin. I'm a longtime member of the Georgetown University admissions staff. I'm also an alumna of Georgetown from the class of 1997. And just thanks to everyone for having me here this evening. It's, it's really fun to be able to, as my colleague just said, begin to wrap up this uh, recruitment season with a, an event here at here at Darien High School. So Georgetown University is one of the 25 oldest universities in the United States, founded in 1789. It's also the oldest Catholic and Jesuit university in America. We have 7,000 undergraduate students who live, work, and study on a main campus, which is spread out over about 110 acres along the Potomac River in the historic Georgetown neighborhood of Washington, DC. So at Georgetown, we're very much a city school located right in the middle of the US Capitol. But at the same time, Georgetown's campus is a very traditional one. It's contained and pedestrian. There's a wall around the front of the university, a set of gates that welcome students in. At Georgetown, a very strong sense of being on and off campus. Um, and therefore, you know, just a tremendous amount of school spirit and campus community. But at the same time at Georgetown that you get to have that really traditional American college campus feel, we're still located in Washington, D.C., so in one of the great political and cultural capitals of the world. And the location of Washington brings along with it, I think, for students, just an enormous amount of opportunity. When our students leave our front gates, they're then out in the surrounding Georgetown neighborhood. If any of you have been to campus or just been to Washington, D.C., you would know that the Georgetown neighborhood almost looks like a little American sort of old-fashioned colonial village that happened to be dropped inside a modern city center, cobblestone streets and trolley tracks, homes and buildings in the American federal style. So it's very cute. And then also in the surrounding area, tons of restaurants, bookstores, shops, and cafes. The Georgetown neighborhood creates very much a college town-like atmosphere around the university. And then further afield, the greater city of Washington, DC. Being in Washington certainly means that you have a front seat to history, but more importantly for our students, just enormous amount of opportunities for internship and research, the opportunity to put your academic knowledge into practical use over your four years at Georgetown to build up your resume to get ready for next steps after the university. Academically, I can tell you that we have four undergraduate academic schools, the Georgetown College, which is our School of Arts and Sciences, the Georgetown School of Nursing and Health Studies, the Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service, which is Georgetown School of International Affairs, and the McDonough School of Business. Students, you know, I think it's important with Georgetown that you not only find your fit at Georgetown, but within Georgetown in terms of which of the undergraduate schools you think meets all of your academic needs, knowing the students in these four schools share a common Georgetown core curriculum and are constantly taking courses of courses across school lines. Um, so you'll pick an undergraduate school at Georgetown, you'll enroll directly in it, and then when you come to campus, you're part of the larger Georgetown community. I think highlights for us certainly include about 350 different undergraduate run student clubs and organizations, 29 varsity sports teams that for the most part compete in Division I in the Big East Conference. And then very importantly, we are very alive at Georgetown in our tradition of being a Jesuit institution. So we consider ourselves to be Hoyas, men and women for others, and there's a strong focus on community service and living our lives in the pursuit of social justice. So come on down, we're open for visits, uh, you know, most days of the week, uh, if you wanna do a campus tour and information session and certainly tons of, of virtual opportunities to connect with Georgetown as well. Thanks so much. Thank you, Kate. Emily? Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good, good evening. I will echo what my colleagues have already said, which is um, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you for having us. Um, it's really a pleasure to spend this time with you. Um, I was at Darien High School for a visit just a couple of weeks ago, and so it's exciting to be back in front of you um, on this panel. Um, I am an Associate Director of Admissions at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut, so not too far away from where you all are. Um, we are a small liberal arts college uh, of about 
2,100 undergraduate students. So, um, but for a small college, we are uh, quite a diverse institution. Our students hail from 48 different states and 80 different countries. Um, our student population is about 13% international, about 23% of our students are self-identified students of color from the United States. Um, and we are about 50-50 in terms of men and women. So um, definitely a really good mix of students um, on our small campus. Um, we were founded in 1823, so actually shortly in 2023, we will be having our 200th birthday, so we are looking forward to that. Um, we are, as I mentioned, a liberal arts college, so that means that we are characterized by uh, typically small class sizes and a highly customizable and flexible curriculum. So at Trinity, we have 41 majors and 27 minors to choose from. There's certainly a lot to choose from. Students do not need to declare their major at Trinity until partway through their sophomore year. So for those first few semesters, they do have the time and space to try different things on and kind of discover their passions, take classes in different areas. Um, no matter what students are majoring in, they will find themselves in small classes. Uh, we are a tight knit community where students are really getting to know their professors and their peers. Uh, we have a student to faculty ratio of nine to one and our average classroom size is about 18 students. So um, you're never Ever going to find yourself in a big lecture hall at Trinity, you will definitely always be in classes where you are very much seen uh, and heard and known um, to one another. Um, in terms of that liberal arts curriculum, what that means is that we do expect all students, regardless of their major, to take classes in a variety of areas, which include arts, humanities, social science, natural science, numeric and symbolic reasoning. We also have a global requirement, which can be fulfilled by taking a global focused course or by studying away. Um, we also have now added a wellness requirement for students as well as co-curricular requirements. Um, a co-curricular requirement basically means that um, we are asking of all of our students that they engage in some type of academic experience outside of the classroom and that they do some real world learning. So that can be through internships, research opportunities, being a teaching assistant for a course, taking a community learning class or by studying away. Um, but we have now introduced a requirement for all students to engage in some type of co-curricular experience in order to graduate. Um, part of the way that we're able to offer those opportunities to students is by being an urban liberal arts college. So I mentioned that we are in Hartford, Connecticut. So we are not in the country's capital like Georgetown, but we are in a state capital in Hartford. Um, it's a good mid-sized city. And as many of you know, being from Connecticut, um, there is a lot going on in Hartford. In addition to it being the seat of state government, lots of major hospitals and medical centers in the area, lots of companies, large and small. Um, there's theater, uh, the country's oldest art museum, the Wadsworth Athenaeum is in Hartford. And so there's definitely a lot directly surrounding Trinity um, that students can get involved in. Um, like Georgetown, we do have more of a traditional campus, historic architecture, big green quads, but if you take a step off of our campus in any direction, you're very much in that city setting. Um, so we really utilize that city environment to open doors for our students and allow them to do that real world learning. Uh, we have over 200 Trinity specific internship opportunities in and around the city of Hartford. So these are companies and organizations that are actually holding spots for Trinity students students. They're coming to us year over year and asking for our students to come and work with them. Um, in addition to all of that, um, we do have lots going on on campus for students to get involved in. We have over 140 different clubs and organizations. Um, we do have several Greek life organizations as well as community and cultural houses. Uh, and we do have 30 different uh, varsity sports teams. We compete at the division three level in the NESCAC group. So NESCAC stands for New England Small College Athletic Conference. It's made up of a variety of small liberal arts colleges dotted around New England like us. Um, and it's widely considered to be uh, the most competitive league within Division Three. I think the students who come to us to play a sport are definitely student athletes with a capital S. We have a lot of students who are here to play their sport and take it seriously, but they're also getting a really well-rounded college experience. Um, and our mascot is the Bantam. If you don't know what a Bantam is, that's okay. Um, it is a chicken, so go Bantams. And I'm gonna end it there. Thank you, Emily. Alec. Such a pleasure to be here tonight. My name is Alec Latang, represented from the Office of Admissions and Recruitment at Central Connecticut State University. And we say we are Central. Central is, is the largest university within the Connecticut State Colleges and University System, which comprises 12 uh, community colleges and the other three sister institutions, Southern, Eastern, and Western. 
Uh, founded in 1849, CCSU is also the state's oldest publicly, publicly founded uh, university. Uh, we comprise of four academic schools, the School of Business, the School of Engineering and Science and Technology, the School of Graduate Studies, the School of Education and Professional Studies. And then we have one college, the Carol A. Ammon College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences. As a comprehensive public university, we have a broad access to quality degree programs at both the baccalaureate masters as well as the doctoral levels. Uh, Central is one of the few universities in Connecticut to be designated by the Carnegie Foundation for the advancement of teaching. Um, our big thing is that we are driving force of economic, social, cultural, and intellectual development within Connecticut, but also broader. Our students hail from over, not only Connecticut, but, uh, but over 40 different states, uh, sorry, 32 different states and 40 international countries. So we do see students from a wide range of places, even though we are a state university. Um, we're division one athletics, 16 varsity programs. We are, our belief is that the connection to community is the fundamental part of who we are at CCSU. It, does, it distinguishes our university from our sister institution, as well as it sets our students apart from their peers. And it builds upon the legacy of academic excellence and equity in education. We have over 100 plus majors in program, over 150 plus clubs and organization uh, with an average size class of about 25, 14 to one student to teacher ratio. And our institution comes at a value. Uh, the in-state price for the university is just under 25,000 for tuition fees as well as room and board. I'd love to talk to you a little bit more about Central. We're open uh, for visit. We have an open house coming up this uh, Sunday, October 31st. Yes, it's Halloween. Come bring your costume. We'd love to see you um, as well as on November 6th. Look forward to engaging more tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Alec. Catherine? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Catherine Decino. I'm one of the Associate Deans of Admission at Union College. Um, and the benefit of going last is that I'm gonna skip really quickly over a lot of the things that describe Union along with a lot of the other colleges on the panel tonight. Um, but I'll tell you that Union is a small liberal arts college located in upstate New York. We're in the city of Schenectady, which is just outside of Albany, the state capital of New York. So we're just under about three hours um, from Darien. Um, again, in some ways, super traditional small liberal arts college, and so all of the things that come with it, again, some of the things that have been discussed tonight, a uh, small campus, we're just over 2,000 students, all undergraduates, small class sizes, our average between about 14 and 21 students, depending on if it's an upper level or an intro level class. Um, all of our classes are faculty led. We don't have any teaching assistants or graduate students leading those courses. Um, very residential campus. Almost all of our students live on campus all four years, including uh, through that senior year. And um, we do have a liberal arts core uh, to the curriculum. We call it the common curriculum. So again, that opportunity to take and be exposed to a variety of different subjects from humanities, arts, and social sciences to science and math and things like that. Some of the things that I think differentiate Union a little bit, uh, one uh, and probably the one we're most known for is that we were the very first liberal arts college in the country to offer engineering. And so we have a really long history of being a campus where liberal arts meet STEM. And we do see about three quarters of our students combine interests on campus. And uh, very often those interests are as diverse as classics and computer science, electrical engineering and dance, and not only combining different majors, but really thinking about the intersections. Where do even two very different academic interests come together? So in an example like classics and computer science, we'll have students research video games and why do so many of them take place in a setting that looks like ancient Greece or ancient Rome or has a gladiator style uh, avatar as part of the gameplay. Um, in the example of engineering and dance, um, we had a student recently create a pair of digital tap shoes as her senior capstone project. So we really see, as I said, liberal arts meet STEM happening, not just on our campus, but among um, our individual students as well. And, and that's really a big piece of who we are. Other things, um, if you're looking to study abroad, do research, do internships, you can be virtually guaranteed you'll have those opportunities. Over 80% of our students do faculty mentored research, over 85% will complete at least one internship, and about 60% uh, will study away from campus for either a term or a mini term. 
Uh, in terms of the community, uh, I mentioned we're residential, lots of clubs and organizations, as you could imagine. Um, I would say some of the larger ones, athletics, we do compete at the Division Three level, except for our men's and women's ice hockey teams, which are Division One. So that does mean that we have a lot of school spirit that sort of starts at those D1 hockey games, but you definitely see trickle into the other sports we offer as well. We see lots of students involved with our outing club. We are in a wonderful location for outdoor recreation. Adirondack Mountains, Mohawk Hudson Rivers, um, right by campus. And we also see lots of students involved with uh, sustainability clubs and with community service. Um, I mentioned Schenectady is a small city, about 60,000 people, great opportunities to connect with the community, both through enjoying all the city has to offer, but also giving back uh, through service. And over half of our students um, are involved with one of our partner projects through our Kenny Community Center, about 30 different programs that we offer through there. Last thing that I'll mention um, is probably the most uniquely union aspect to our campus, and that's something called our Minerva program. I could spend the entire time we have uh, here just talking about the Minerva, so I'm just going to give you a quick snapshot and then encourage you to check out our website or come for a visit to learn more. But the Minervas are basically seven communities within a community that all of our students are a part of. Everyone is affiliated with one of the Minervas throughout their four years at Union. Each Minerva has a house on campus that serves as a central gathering spot for that community to come together, whether informally or formally. And Union also gives each of the Minervas a programming budget as well in order to plan events and bring community together that way. And the Seven Houses Together hosts about 500 different events on campus each year, ranging from social to intellectual, one-time only things to weekly events. Um, and every student has the ability to attend those events, but also to help in the creation and planning of them. Um, so definitely check us out, union.edu. We are open for visitors on campus, lots of virtual programs, again, like lots of, lots of my colleagues here tonight, and we'd love to have you learn more. Thank you all so much. And such amazing opportunities going on at each of your institutions. Every time we do these, I really want to go back to school um, for a minute. Um, so thank you for that. Really exciting. Um, I'd like to move into maybe some topic specific questions. And Kate, I'd love to start with you. Can you speak a little bit um, about, I was, I'm giggling a little bit because I was going to say admission trends. And that seems like an oxy oxymoron a little bit these days um, because it's Trends are hard right now. I understand lots of changes happening, lots of things that are hard to predict. Um, but you know, it, it, are you seeing, you know, changes in application numbers? Are you hearing from your colleagues, you know, early decision versus regular? Are we seeing even even changes that are a result of COVID? Any any trends you're seeing that you can share, kind of on a on a national level? Sure. Thank you. I, you know, we're in really unusual times. I mean, I think we would all agree, you know, and on our side of the desk, on the admission side. I, you know, even we ended the, 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 the year where we admitted the class of 2024, and I would imagine that my colleagues would agree with me that it was a scary time um, where we wondered whether we would fill our class. <laughs> and, you know, we really wondered whether students would feel comfortable um, going away from home, living in a residential community. And at that point, March, April, May into the summer uh, of last year of 2020, things were so uncertain. So we all obviously got through that. Um, I think there was obviously that summer, very unusually high numbers of waitlist activity. And of course, students choosing to, you know, take a gap year, defer, take a leave of absence, combinations, different schools called it different things. But, you know, I think that regardless of whether or not the schools were open or virtual or somewhere in between, you had a lot of students who were current or incoming who, who, who didn't come last year. And so that added to the sort of highly unusual atmosphere that we admitted the the last year's class in the class of 2025 so I think that you know I don't know that I could talk to the entire landscape but I could tell you that within selective college admissions and, and sort of the Georgetown's peer group and I, and I think honestly for most colleges across the country there was an increase in applications last year highly unusual I think, again, I spent a lot of last summer gearing up to last year's application cycle, extremely worried about whether or not anybody would apply to Georgetown at all, right? I mean, honestly, it just seemed like our entire way of doing business and enrolling in class obviously had been upended, and we were all learning how to navigate Zoom and the best way to 
you know, communicate the campus and academic experience to prospective students without them being able to visit, which is a tough thing. So, you know, because for over all the years, all we've said to students is go to the campus, you'll get a feeling if it's the right fit. And then when that's taken away, you know, what do you do? So I think we all worked really, really hard to sort of as move as many, you know, academic programs, tours, student panels, faculty showcases, a million different combinations of things, which I think we spent the whole of last summer and, and autumn figuring out, and I think we're still figuring out, to, to try to bring it, bring it sort of home to students. What I saw, you know, we're not part of the common application, but in, in, in thinking about tonight, I did some research, and from what I understand, the common application had 11% increase in applications submitted last year, but only 2% increase in unique users. So I think what really happened is, is that for a combination of different reasons, not being able to visit the campus, in, you know, worried about how many people had deferred, test optional, test blind policies at a lot of schools, I think you probably saw to Darianne, I think a lot, a lot of students said, I, I'm not ready to make a decision. Hopefully maybe in the spring of 2021, I'll be able to visit and see, see what's my best fit. So I think a lot of students applied to more schools and you saw application numbers go up anywhere from 10 to, I, I understand there's one college in closer to your neck of the woods that went up over a hundred percent and bless those admissions officers for getting through that, that, that situation. So, um, you know, application numbers went up and, uh, and then, you know, you went into the season in the spring where we talked about something, you know, things like yields and weight this. So for, for parents, you know, you'll typically have, you know, at, at, at schools, three different kind of ways that you can apply to schools. Rolling admissions, where when you send in your application, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know the, app, the decisions are rolled out as, as applications are admitted. And you can hear at various points in your senior year about whether that institution is going to offer you a place. Early action, early decision. Those those um, those due dates typically coming around, you know, beginning of November. Answers typically before the holidays, middle of December, and then regular decision round end of December, uh, beginning of January, with decisions typically coming out on or before April first. So. Um, I think there's not a ton of data that's been released on this, but I think that some schools last year that had especially early decision binding programs leaned more heavily in many cases into those early decision programs, again, because of the uncertainty. Um, I think parents, I would say that when you're thinking about things like yield, which is the number of students who take a school up on its offer of admission, when you're thinking about admit rates, it's important to think about whether the school is rolling, early action not binding or early decision binding. Um, when you think about those numbers, because it, it, you know every uh, just an admit rate and just a yield number is not gonna tell you the hotel. You wanna know the admit rates at different application points that schools offer. Um, and, and you really wanna think about yield in, in, in relationship to that. Because of course, if you have binding early programs, early decision, which can also come in multiple rounds, you know, you probably for most schools have 90% yield on those students, which of course brings your overall yield up and it's really different for rolling or early action schools. So parents, I think when you, my, my bottom line with all this is when you think about the numbers that schools are, present, are presenting to you, know that um, you need to look behind those numbers to find out kind of the truth about what's going on in terms of application and yield. Um, most students when they apply to a school are either admitted at early, perhaps deferred, um, or denied, and then at regular decision, uh, admitted, um, uh, waitlisted, or 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 denied to admission to the university. Um, and a waiting list is formed in case there are open places at a college. I think that there was, I can at least talk for Georgetown's peer group, a lot less waitlist activity last year than there had been in previous years. Yield was quite high. Again, a gigantic surprise given the experience that we had the summer before where we were admitting people off the waiting list until the middle of, of August. Um, and so, uh, you know, waiting lists, I think, are, are, are formed by schools with the hope that schools will be able to admit off a waiting list. Um, often those waiting lists allow not only schools to come up to their enrollment goal, but to round out their class, you know, geographic balance, gender balance, um, you know, balance within academic programs, right? Like I can talk for us, for example, we have four undergraduate schools, each one has its own enrollment goal. So there might be a year where we take some students from a wait list for one of our undergraduate schools and not for the other three. So, uh, you know, there's also, I think, beyond that wait list number, that there's more stories to be told in terms of the ways in which colleges need to go go about filling out, filling out their classes. I don't, I'm, who knows what's gonna happen this year. I think a lot of us are expecting that the numbers will be strong, but perhaps not as high as they were last year because 
I think, you know, either campuses are open for visits and students are able to get a better sense of whether or not a school is the right fit for them. Or, you know, in tandem with that, I think the virtual programming that we've all done, like we, we've got a year under our belts now, and I think we've all gotten pretty good at this and know how to do it and how to present. So students have a lot of access to information. I think at least for Georgetown, I can say that I think we're probably going to be lower in application numbers than last year, but perhaps up from any other number, the, at least the five years prior. So we shall see what happens um, going forward. Final thing I'll say is that I think one of the lasting effects of COVID is that we are probably never going to step back from having virtual programming. You know, we want to be in communities and schools, meeting families where they live, meeting students where they live, because as an admissions officer, it's critical for you to understand the context which a student's applying from. But we also know that you know, Zoom has offered students who, who either, you know, are geographically very far away or don't have the resources to, to travel to a school to be able to get a sense of it. You know, maybe they'll have the opportunity to visit just once. Maybe they'll want to wait to see if they got admitted before they come and visit. So virtual programming will allow them to know whether or not it's, it's a good enough fit for them to apply. So I think C, going forward, I think we all can't wait to get back on the road even more than maybe some of us did this, this autumn. Um, but I think virtual programming remaining for the foreseeable future so that students can get easy access to all of us. Thank you so much. That was super helpful. And I know that so many of our questions, I mean, I feel like in college admissions, the answer was often, it depends, even pre-COVID, so much of it was often. And now it's like, it, it really, you know, it's, it's ever changing. And so um, I know that's challenging for families. I have a senior in high school, um, so I'm living it as well. And everyone just wants kind of really concrete answers. And those are hard right now for everybody, including for you sitting on that side of the desk. So we appreciate and respect that. Thank you for all that information, Kate. Um, Brandy, um, students have, um, depending on when they're where they're applying, a variety of different ways they can apply. There's institutional applications and the common application, and then a couple of schools are still using the coalition. So can you, um, I know um, Indiana has its own process, but can you speak a little bit to kind of different forms of that, um, kind of what students should avoid? And, and we get the question a lot about how students should use like that COVID box on the common application. So if you have any thoughts on that, that'd be awesome. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, it's, this is also one of those it depends type of questions and certainly something that I welcome any of my colleagues to jump in at any point as well because Indiana has done several things. Um, I've been with the Office of Admissions for almost 16 years and we for the longest time only had our, our institutional application. We joined the Common App late in the game. So we are a Common App school now, as well as having our own institutional application still. We were for a brief stint, a, a co coalition school as well, um, which we are no longer. And one of the reasons for that is that we did not see a huge draw from the coalition. Um, so I don't have as much background knowledge as far as the coalition goes, but I'm happy to share what knowledge I do have. Um, so just in general, based upon my experience, there are three different application platforms, the common coalition and institutional um, applications. It is also my experience that if a school offers more than one platform, they don't necessarily have a preference which one you choose and they're going to be reviewed the same. So it really is what is convenient to you. We are trying to make our institutions as accessible to you as possible. And that's why some of us do have multiple platforms. To, for you to utilize. Um, the Common App and the Coalition are similar in the sense that they both allow you to use one general application to apply to more than one school. Um, I'm not, again, I'm not as familiar with the Coalition, but I believe the main difference here is that they have a digital locker. Um, so the digital locker is there so that you can store those important files. So it's kind of a, a storage facility for your you know, your recommendation letters, your essays and things like that. So it's there for you to store that. This is one of the main difference, differences between the coalition and the common application. Both application platforms are essentially divided into two different sections. So you have the general information section that all schools will use. And then you will have the school specific section. This is where you will see um, schools that are asking for additional essays or additional information that they need to process your application. So for example, as far as IU goes, this is where you would find our supplemental writing essay. Okay. Um, now, as far as the COVID question goes, 
I think that this is my personal opinion. So I will definitely take anybody else's opinion on this as well. But my personal opinion is that I think it was a good addition for, for them to have this box because it allows students an opportunity to share their experience with us without taking up that valuable word count in their essay. But I do feel that you should only use it if you have had more of an extenuating circumstance that differs from what the vast majority of us have experienced during COVID. So COVID, we all went through it, um, which I guess is a good thing because we all understand it. But you may have a very personal experience that you want to make sure that we understand because maybe it really did impact your high school career. That's what I would encourage you to put in that section. Not every student needs to put something in the COVID section. Um, but it is there for you if you really do feel like it impacted your high school career and that is something that you want us to know, okay? Um, a few other things to keep in mind is that all schools, even if they use the common or the coalition, will require different information. So again, IU, we have a supplemental essay, but we do not use the common app essays. So that's also something to keep in mind. So if there's something that you want me to know, you're gonna to have to put it in that essay because I'm not gonna look at your common app essay. So these are things where it depends, you need to check with your individual schools comes into play. Um, let's see, we also don't require letters of recommendation, but we will accept one teacher and one counselor. Now there are some schools that will absolutely not accept any letters of recommendation. So again, that's something to keep in mind as well. Um, some schools allow you to self-report your test scores and your grades on the application. Um, so that's something to keep an eye out for as well. Know that there may be some stipulations with that and that you would have to send the official score report at a later date, but you can self-report them on your application. Um, you can also sometimes upload additional resumes and activity sheets and videos and websites and things like that. That is not available to every institution, um, but is, is there for some. I've had several students send me videos, YouTube videos, and that's great. They say, I didn't find a place where I could put this on my common application. Well, you didn't find a place because we don't accept that information. There's no way for me to add that to your file. Um, so if it's not there, it's probably because we're not able to accept it. There's a reason why it's not there. So only supply the information that we're asking for. Um, and, um, and, and know that you can't always reach out to us, but yeah, only supply the information that we're asking for. But basically the key takeaway here is that with many answers that you're gonna receive tonight, things are very school specific. And that's why we're here. We're here to help guide you through that. So don't ever hesitate to reach out to us. Again, the Common and Coalition, they have very much streamlined the application process and made it a little bit easier for students to apply to multiple schools. So that's great. Um, always check school websites for some of these in, ins and outs, these nuances about what we accept and what we won't accept. Talk to your counselor. They're great resources for you. They also know how to get a hold of us if you can't find us. Um, so, so you can definitely get a hold of us that way. And again, reach out to us if you have any questions or concerns. I know there's a lot of different platforms out there. There's a lot of these little ins and outs. Many students are very nervous, um, especially given COVID about how that impacted their high school career. Please do not be nervous. We're in the business of admissions. We're here to offer students admission into our institutions, okay? So we are looking for those reasons. So please reach out to us. But again, I welcome my colleagues to throw anything else in there because I use all over the place as far as applications concerned. That's why you were the perfect person to talk about it. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. That was awesome. Um, Alec, I'd love to move to you. Um, we are thrilled that most campuses seem to be open um, for visits. I know, again, as a senior mom, I've been enjoying touring around with my son as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about like maximizing a visit to campus, um, how and when students should be communicating with, um, with, with representatives, admission representatives, um, and could you clear up the myth of demonstrating demonstrated interest a little bit and how that a visit might how a visit might play into that you know it, that's a question that has been boiling a lot for many people you know how important are the college visits 
Uh, with the given demands, I, I think the, the, the one thing is that not all applicants understand the unique and important role that the campus visit play in part of the process. You know, as you think about the admissions process, it's, it's multifaceted and sometimes very time consuming because why you start to prioritize certain things like the application essays, um, your standardized exams, building your college list. But that, but I'll tell you, the fun part of it is actually really going on that journey. And there's many ways that we've opened that opportunity for that journey to happen, right? Being that COVID has really increased the opportunities for these virtual visits, but really that campus visit is huge. Visiting multiple schools allows students to really gain perspectives on what type of environment that they're really looking for, as well as it helps them to highlight their interest in the very prospective colleges that they're, that they're thinking this might be an opportunity. There's more to the campus visit than just a gut check. You know, sometimes a student will say, I drove to the campus and I really didn't feel at home, so I didn't get out of the car. Uh, there's more to it than that, than that, that piece. Uh, whether or not a school is a good fit for a student, uh, there's a few other reasons why I think the college visit is so crucial. One, when you mentioned the question about the demonstrated interest, a lot of us have actually put that in in regards to um, that being a piece or component of our admission evaluation, that demonstrated aspect. So if we're looking at a student applicant and we see that they actually visited, whether it was a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a college counselor, uh, uh, an admission representative at their high school, and then they followed it up with emails and then showed up at, on campus, met with alums, all of these things show demonstrated interest and can really add another piece of element to basically, can we see you at our college? And if we're thinking of that one piece that's gonna slide you over the edge to say, yes, I'm definitely admitting that student, that's the piece that some of our college, our colleagues are actually using. So that that demonstrated interest is key. It, it As each of us, I know we talked a little bit about the yield uh, concept, as each of us try to maintain our yield rate uh, or the number of students that we accept um, to, uh, who choose to enroll, that's the piece that helps us to gain access to understanding, okay, this person came to my campus 10 times. Okay, I can bet that this person is going to show up uh, when it comes to paying the deposit and showing up and matriculating to my campus. So demonstrating your interest to a specific school uh, not only allows you to get that firsthand experience of the campus, but also we can track whether or not um, you're really truly it, uh, interested. And it goes more, more than just you know, saying, hey, I'm filling out this card. It's also registered in advance for the official tours and information sessions virtually as well as physically on ground. But the visit really helps you picture yourself on campus. I can't really say more, more, more to that. It, it's really a great way, whether it's a large research institution or that small liberal arts college, physically placing yourself in that different type of uh, environment will help you determine what kind of one learning atmosphere is gonna be most appealing to you. Um, as well as it may, even if you have preconceived uh, thoughts or notions about what kind of college you wish to attend, it will really allow you to see whether or not you're missing out on any of the other alternatives that may ultimately be the better match for you as you're going through your college list. You get an opportunity to have more of an in-depth detail direct from the source. You know, oftentimes us admission rep, when we come to a high school visit or information session or a college fair, we have such a short window to really tell you the world about each of our institution. And hopefully you walk away saying, oh, I can see myself at that institution. I really enjoyed that conversation. And you know, our job is to hopefully gather that, gather some of your detailed information so we can reach out further and ping you a little bit more via email or phone call, just to make sure that we engage you a little bit more because we know we only had that elevator pitch for that short period of time to really encompass all that we have. So the, so the tour allows you to really get much more in-depth um, answers to your question, your various questions, as well as the opportunity. Many of us talked about just the aesthetics of our campus, the landmarks, you know, of our campus. What sets one college apart from another? The ability to walk away with as much information as possible, and then, of course, as I mentioned, as we think about the visit, the reason why it's so crucial. There's if you can't visit, there's so many other alternatives to those visits, right? Because why? We come to you 
you know, we may bring video streams, we may bring, we may bring banners and, and informational pieces that we can hand out to help you understand who we are as an institution. But there's also ways of reaching out to alumni in the local area that can talk about their experience and whether or not the college is doing not only an information session or reception, that they may bring others to that reception, a nice way to get to know that institution. But the virtual landscape has really exploded. Companies like you visit has made a killer in regards to going out and featuring colleges in a variety of different ways, exciting students even more as if when you finish watching that 10 to 15 minute or even three minute video, you feel like, oh my God, this is exactly where I'm applying. I can see myself. This has everything I'm looking for. It showcases the, the sense of events as well as activities happening on campus. I, I say this, whether you're preparing for your first college tour or attempting to finalize your list for the best fit institutions, the visit plays a crucial part in that puzzle. The visit can help you, whether it's a, a virtual visit initially, but that visit to that campus can really ensure that you get the best sense of understanding and information to help make a solid judgment call as to, can I see myself here for the next four years? Um, and, you know, sometimes we say it's okay if you didn't get it right, you know, but the, the reason why many don't get it right is because they didn't take the full experience of getting all the information about that institution. They were just going off of a whim or a preconceived notion. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I truly feel that when you think about finding ways to separate institutions from one another, it's really the ability to get on that campus and physically see it for yourself. Because as you've heard tonight from all of us, there are certain things that is very similar about our various institution, despite the sizes that we have or the amenity, or the amount of um, acreage that we that we sit on or where we're located, rural versus suburban versus uh, in the city style. We all sometimes sound so familiar. The visit really helps you to create that opportunity to really ping, uh, do I see myself here and help make your choice a little bit easier when it comes to making that final decision. Awesome, thank you, Alec. And I, I would just throw in, you know, the advice that our office often gives as well is, um, if you're not applying to a school early decision, which is binding, um, especially if something is geographically a little bit harder to get to, it's okay to apply to a school without having visited. Um, yes. What I always tell my students is, please don't deposit at a school you've never seen, and please don't apply to a school early decision that you've never seen. Um, those are sort of recipes for transfers, in my opinion. But we had plenty of students who will apply to a non under a non-binding plan because they just haven't been able to get there for a variety of reasons, and then we'll go and do sort of an accepted student you know, tour. There's lots of awesome things in the spring with accepted student days. And so I don't want our families to feel the, the visit is priceless, I think. But if, if a student um, is like, you know, I really, this all looks great on paper. I've done a lot of the virtual visits, which you've spoken about are so amazing, the, the, the things that are being put out by schools. Um, but we just can't get to campus right now. In our opinion, that's okay, as long as it's not binding and as long as you don't deposit there before you see. So and don't be afraid to ask, you know, our offices are very much open. Um, is that a part, a crucial piece to the admissions process that demonstrated interest of me physically being on, on your campus because I can't get there? That's how many of the fly-in programs were started at many institutions was because students said, I, I really like what I hear about your institution, but I can't visit uh, because of such reasons. And schools have made it possible to get students the information or even get them on campus at certain times. So don't be afraid to ask the question, you know, is this a crucial piece in my in the decision? Because, you know, I, I've heard of it on the, the one side of the, the house where basically, you know, an admissions office didn't choose the student because they had never visited. But really that student's, that student's interest was so rich that students uh, understand of the college, they would have been a great fit. And they had to appeal and go through that process. But it it was something that they didn't ask in the beginning. So please don't be afraid to ask that question of the various colleges. And I love that you say that and we give the same advice because it sort of takes the, it depends out of it, right? We're like, just ask, right. you know, and if, if they can share the information with you honestly and candidly, you know, the schools definitely will. Um, and I, in, in our experience, it's been like, if 
the feedback's been like, you know, for example, if a student was applying to Central from Darien High School, I think the expectation would be that they make the visit, right? That, right. that yep. it's close enough. Um, you know, maybe Indiana, you know, a little bit more challenging. And so I think there's also in my, you know, my experience and understanding amongst higher ed colleagues that, you know, that there's a geography thing and that they'll work with students if geography is a barrier or finances yeah. are a barrier or any of that. So Correct. thank you so much for that. Um, Emily, we um, often tell our students that this process is a balance between data and voice and data, GPA and test scores and such are just one piece of it. And those voice pieces, most importantly, in my opinion, the student essay, um, if it's available as, as part of the application. Um, can you talk a little bit to the essay, um, how a student should take advantage of those precious 650 words on the common application? Um, maybe a topic or two that they should avoid if you have thoughts on that, um, but anything that just tips for that, that essay would be wonderful. Yes, and I'm very happy to talk on this topic. I frequently do a whole hour long essay workshop, so we're gonna keep this under an hour, I promise, and I'm just gonna give you the highlights. Um, I appreciate what you said about balancing data and voice, Megan. Um, when I think about the college essay, voice is the word I usually use to describe it. It is really the, the one opportunity that you really have to include your voice and really show and tell us who you are, uh, not just as a student, but as a person and as a human being um, through that essay. Uh, essays are my favorite part of the application. Um, I know they are often not students' favorite part because I think students get very um, needlessly stressed about the essay. I think it should be your favorite part. Right, it's, your, it's showcasing yourself and, and who you are. Um, so I'm happy to talk about a couple of different things. Um, one is common app prompts, doesn't matter which one you choose, right? They're, they're designed to be broad on purpose. They're designed to do what a prompt does, which is to prompt you to think and reflect about yourself and your values and your interests. And um, so I would say read through all those prompts jot down some initial thoughts for each one and you'll be able to figure out which one is the best one for you to write. Um, worst case scenario, there is, a, there is a common app prompt that says, choose a topic of your own design. So you can actually write about whatever you want um, and you can just select that topic. Um, my number one tip, if you remember nothing else of what I said um, is choose a topic that is authentic to you, right? make sure that you are writing about what you want to write about. Because I think so often um, students get caught up in trying to guess what admissions counselors are interested in hearing, right? And here's the plot twist. The only thing I'm interested in is getting to know you, right? So there is no special topic that is absolutely gonna get you into Trinity or Union or Georgetown or any of, the, of these other schools, right? Um, you, you should just choose a topic that you are comfortable with, choose something that you're excited to write about, choose something that you want to share with other people that you're comfortable sharing with other people. Um, and this is where I get into my myths, right? I'm gonna debunk some myths about college essay topics. One myth that's out there is that you um, should write about something that your friend wrote about because your friend wrote about it and got into Georgetown. So it'll get you into Georgetown too. No, because that topic was authentic to them and that's probably why they got in, right? Um, if it's not authentic to you, do not write about it. Um, another common myth is that you have to write about some big um, tragedy that happened to you or some major thing that you overcame, right? It has to be a sob story. Nope, it absolutely does not. Because again, if that's not authentic to you, if that's not the story that, that shows us best who you are, probably not what we need, what we're looking for, right? Um, the other myth that I get a lot is that you shouldn't choose a, a topic that you think is gonna be common or that you know a lot of people are gonna write about. So for example, if you have a lot of friends who are soccer players and you know that your friends are writing about their experience with soccer, that you shouldn't write about it, right? Because too many people are writing about it and you won't stand out. This is a myth and I'll tell you why. Because again, each essay is unique to each student, right? So two different essays about soccer can actually be really different and can show and tell me very different things about those two different students. Um, I say this from a place of experience. For many years, I worked at a school that was entirely engineering students and I would read five plus essays per day during reading season about robotics. I read a lot of essays about robotics because those were the students who were attracted to my school. They were students who were involved in robotics and every essay was different. 
And every essay showed me something different about that student. Because again, as long as you're choosing a topic that's authentic to you, it doesn't matter if it's common. It doesn't matter if it's weird. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, kind of off the beaten path, as long as it's authentic to you. Um, some other missteps to avoid, um, choose one topic, stay focused and dig deep on that one thing, right? So tell me one story from start to finish. Um, so often I see students who try to do things like summarize their entire resume in their essay or try to tell me every single thing there is to know about them in 650 words. Um, that's not the goal of the essay, right? There's lots of other things that we're learning about you from the different pieces of your application. And you wanna think about your application as a whole, right? So we're gonna see your resume, we're gonna see that activities list, we're gonna see the classes you've taken, um, so I think it's a better use of that space to pick one topic that, again, is really authentic to you, that allows you to talk genuinely about yourself and dig deep on that topic and really tell the story in a complete way, beginning, middle, and end. Um, the other misstep to avoid is um, over-editing, right? So once you have a draft, I know some students who will rewrite and rewrite and rewrite and edit and edit and edit. Um, and I think you should definitely have multiple drafts of your essay. I think it is good to do some editing so you avoid sloppy mistakes and grammar problems and things like that. But um, too many drafts runs the risk of you losing your voice, of you editing yourself out of the essay, right? Um, it's kind of like putting a really brightly colored shirt into the washing machine over and over and over again. The more you wash it, the more it's going to fade and fade and fade until it doesn't really look like the same shirt anymore. And so you want to make sure that you're, you know, do a good job on your essay, produce something you're proud of, but at a certain point, and your college counselor can help you find when this point comes, put it to bed, right? It's good enough. There's no such thing as perfection. And I promise you it's good enough, right? Um, so don't, don't edit it so much that you run the risk of losing your voice. Um, my other tip is read it aloud. Make sure it sounds like you, right? Again, it's your voice. It should sound like you when you read it. If you're using really big vocabulary words that you wouldn't normally use in real life, take them out of there. No one, no one uses the word extemporaneous. Don't put it in your essay, right? Um, I want it to sound like you. Um, topics to avoid. So I, I stand very solidly in the camp of like, I think there are there are not really a whole lot of like bad topics out there. I do have four things that I will suggest that you avoid and I call them the four Ds. So the four Ds are depression, death, divorce, and dating. Um, and the reason I say these are topics to maybe think about avoiding um, is not because I think these are not valid experiences, right? I know that all four of these things are things that high school students definitely experience um, and that can shape you as a person in lots of different ways. Um, but if I'm being honest, um, as an admissions counselor, it's pretty rare that I've seen a student do one of those topics really well in a way that showcases who they are and doesn't just like explain the situation or end up in a place where they're telling someone else's story, right? You want to make sure that the story is focused on you and who you are, that you're not talking about somebody else's experience. Um, or writing in a whole essay about someone who passed away, for example, right? It should be about you. Um, and you wanna make sure, again, that you're focusing on telling the story of who you are through a situation and not just describing the situation itself. And so um, those four Ds, I think, are topics where it's hard to do that well. It's hard to, to take on that topic and do it well. So those are the ones that I usually suggest students avoid. Um, the last thing I'll say before I uh, just kind of and my spiel is um, about supplemental essays, right, which are a little bit different from your main essay that you might be submitting with the Common App or the Coalition App. Um, some colleges will ask you for supplemental essays that are specific to them. Um, others will not. Um, if a college is offering you the opportunity to submit a supplemental essay, whether it's optional or required, I would take time and care with it. Um, I would use it as an opportunity to let the college gain additional insight into your character. Um, and I, it's also a good way to, we just talked about with Alec, demonstrating interest, right? So showing the college that you've really researched them, that you've gotten to know them, you understand what this college is about, and that 
you're able to articulate your specific fit for the institution. Um, so definitely when it comes to those supplemental essays, make sure you do your research, get to know your colleges, visit if you can, um, and don't wait until the last minute to write all of your supplemental essays the night before because we can tell. Um, so uh, that is, I'm gonna end it there. There's tons, tons more that I could talk about with essays, but make it your voice, make it authentic and you're good to go. That was awesome. Thank you. We might we might be hitting you up to do that hour long essay writing workshop with our students. That's that was great. And and we say to our students as well, like if they're supplementals, those are the questions they probably care most about. And so I think they sometimes are an afterthought because people get so focused on that main essay. But I think that was all really, really great advice. Um, Catherine, can you speak to um, resumes and activities? I know many of our students are concerned, especially since, you know, so most of their high school experience has been interrupted or impacted, um, clubs canceled, sports canceled, or seasons shortened or impacted. And um, how, what's the best way for students to showcase what they've done? Um, how important are the activities and the extracurriculars? Um, and I, I, you know, one of the things I know, we, we talk a lot about um, quality over quantity in terms of um, activities and resumes and, um, and how doing one thing with great love and passion over time is, just as you know, probably better than doing 50 things once. Um, so can you just give us your experience with activities and resumes and how students should best showcase themselves? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, first and foremost, you're exactly right. I, I definitely use that phrase quality over quantity a lot talking about activities lists, but really it, it goes a little bit deeper to deeper than that. And, and to use, you know, a word that Emily was using talking about that essay, it's that authenticity. Um, and that's the number one word, thing we're looking for in an extracurricular activities list is did the student make the choices in terms of how they're going to spend their time in a genuine on an authentic way and, and a way that shows that they thought about these choices and chose things that they enjoy, that interest them, that they think will help them grow as a person because they want to grow as a person. And we can definitely see the difference between activities lists with that authenticity versus those where you get the sense that the student is doing a whole lot of things that they think look good on a college resume that they think colleges want to see. And and it is different for each student. You know, there are students who are involved with dozens of different things and are not doing it solely because they want to put that on a college resume. It's because they have a lot of different interests and they're the type that like to keep busy. And we can see that. We know when that's the case. And, and there's, you know, different ways that, that we can see that come through. And then same thing for a student who is maybe only involved with one or two things. But again, you can tell that it's really sort of going above and beyond in, in each of those activities. So I would say the things that, that we notice that sort of tell that story are long-term involvement, um, you know, students that have sort of stuck with an activity, um, growth within that activity, starting to take on leadership roles, getting more involved, um, any type of involvement that goes above and beyond just what's required of a general member, you know, not just showing up weekly to the meetings, but volunteering for things and, and going above and beyond in, in that way. Um, and then things that are tied to your interests. So if you know you have one or two super strong interests and everything is, is connected to that, great. Maybe you are involved with a lot of different things, but we see through your essay, through your recommendation letters, that again, that's just who you are. You have a lot of different things you care about. You know, we can definitely see some of those things come through. So authenticity, again, number one thing that we're looking for. In terms of types of activities, again, definitely not one thing. We're not looking for everyone to play a sport or everyone to play an instrument or everyone to be involved with service. It's going to vary from student to student. Um, and uh, it's also not just about sort of clubs and teams and organizations. I think sometimes students think that that's where the activities list has to end um, or maybe start or end. And uh, it's really about much more than that. We want to know about hobbies you have. Maybe you ski every single weekend with your family or you read like crazy and you don't do either of those through a team or an organization through your high school, but they're still a big piece of who you are, we want to know about those things. Um, or you have a part-time job, whether it's something you have to have because you're helping support your family or you're saving for college, 
or you have just chosen to take on that job because you know it teaches life skills and responsibility. You know, we want to hear about those. And lastly, we want to hear about family responsibilities and things like that. Um, very often, students who have to head home after school to take care of a sibling or take care of an elderly relative maybe aren't as able to get sort of traditionally involved as they would have liked. Um, and by letting us know about these responsibilities, again, we can see, see that whole picture. Um, because at the end of the day, what, what we're looking for in that extracurriculars list is just to picture you as a member of our community. What role are you going to play? How are you going to get involved? How are you going to give back? And I don't necessarily mean through service, but how are you going to contribute to our community at the same time that the community is sort of contributing to your growth and, and your, uh, you know, maturity as a, as a person and a student. So, you know, those are the big things that we're looking for. Um, beyond that, I know the, the second part of the question was about, you know, COVID and, and how to sort of overcome or explain the, the changes to things. I mean, I, I think what I'll say about extracurriculars list is the same about this whole process. We're all going through this. And yes, we don't all have 18 year olds or we're not 18 year olds, but I'm talking to you right now, sitting on the floor of my son's bedroom because it's the best place to get Wi-Fi. And normally I would be sitting on a stage and have had a great meal with my colleagues before this event. Like we all have had these huge, huge changes to our everyday, you know, everyday activities. And, and we know that and we get that. And so um, I wouldn't lose sleep over that. I wouldn't worry about that. I also would keep in mind that we're not, you know, analyzing year by year, day by day. If you've been involved with something, you know, since ninth grade and it was really different last year, if you're summarizing the ways you're involved and the things the club does over the three or four years you've been involved, we're not going to care that the stuff you listed didn't totally happen in junior year or in sophomore year. Like, again, we, we understand we have our office calls it COVID grace, showing COVID grace we get that, you know, this has been a, has been a crazy time. So um, that's some of my advice. I would say the, the last thing that I'll mention, this is, is probably the easiest of it all, um, is just to make sure that you're really explaining the things that you're involved in. Don't use abbreviations. I always say the only abbreviation I think you can get away with is NHS. We all know what NHS stands for. If it's not that, don't abbreviate it. Tell us what it is. Don't assume even by the full name of it, we understand it. Definitely take the time to explain the activity, but also strike that balance between explaining the activity, but also not using up that whole character count just to talk about the activity. We want to know about your specific involvement in it as well. So sort of striking that balance. And if you do need to send something additional, um, I was glad actually to hear, you know, when Brandy was talking about, um, you know, IU and, and what they require or look at or don't look at, I, I'm glad she was able to share that because you Union is a place that looks at everything, sort of the opposite. We'll look at anything and everything you send. And I always tell students, send everything. If a college doesn't look at it, then they don't look at it. At least you sent it in. You felt like you told your story. You shared what you wanted to share. You know, yes, there are a couple colleges that will say, do not send us this. Do not bog us down with X, Y, Z. And, and of course, make sure you're listening to those. But beyond that, just send it. And if we read it, we read it. And if we don't, we don't. At least you got it out there. And there's a lot of places um, like the unions of the world that are looking at all those things. And so specific to an extracurriculars list, if that's sending a supplemental resume, you just feel like you're not able to say everything you want to say in that common app activity section, go ahead and, and send additional information. We're happy. Again, we're happy to see it or we'll pass by it and at least you got it out there and, and don't have any regrets with that. Thank you. That was like literally everything I was hoping you would say. So, um, you know, again, just trying to provide some reassurance in these, you know, crazy, crazy times. So thank you for that. And um, I think one of the most frequent questions that are coming across our desk um, as counselors is about testing. So obviously pre-COVID, many, many, many schools were test optional. Uh, last year, pretty much everybody was test optional. Now some have gone back, some still are. And so I, one of the questions that I get is, is it really optional? And um, if, is there 
or, or are students who choose for whatever reason not to submit test scores at any kind of disadvantage, so to speak, if they do not. So if you want to speak for your own institutions or just, you know, or generally what you've heard, um, but any advice you can give about um, is a school really test optional when they say they are test optional and advantage versus disadvantage. Um, and if you could also include um, what you're hearing or seeing, again, specific to your school otherwise about the essay on the ACT. I know it's, this is, the essay is sort of a dying, the testing essay is sort of a dying breed, um, but should students still be doing it if they have the opportunity to on the ACT? I'm happy to jump in here um, and say, at least I will speak for Trinity. When we say test optional, we mean truly, truly optional. There is no penalty. There is no disadvantage for a student not submitting a test score. And for context, so Trinity has been test optional since 2015. Um, prior to COVID, we were at about the 50-50 mark in terms of students sending or not. So about 50% of our applicants were sending test scores, 50% weren't. Last year, that dropped to under 20% sending test scores. So uh, most of the applications I read in the most recent cycle did not have a test score, um, and that is totally okay. Um, and I would actually say in some ways, it might actually hurt you to send a test score that is lower than a college's average, right, at this point, because so few students are sending testing that sending a score that doesn't quite align with what the college profile is, is actually probably um, possibly going to not, I don't want to say hurt you. I never want to say anything that you submit hurts you in the process, but it's not going to help you um, versus sending no scores like neutral zone, right? We can't evaluate what we don't have in front of us. Um, so it's not going to hurt you in any way to not send that score. Um, in terms of the ACT essay, I have no strong opinion because we're a test optional college, so we don't need the ACT anyway. I would say that's a good question. Again, like you said before, you can eliminate the it depends by asking your individual colleges. I would say the schools on your list, check their websites, ask, reach out and ask um, if they require that, because um, that will help you figure out if you need to do it or not. I'll just add two, two quick things for Union. Um, number one, I, we're test optional. We've been test optional, I want to say, about 15 years now. Um, definitely, again, like most colleges, I would say we saw kind of a flip. We used to be, you know, about a third of students were not submitting scores, two-thirds were. And this past year, we saw kind of the reversal of that and, and two-thirds test optional and a third with testing. Um, I would take it a little bit farther to say it at Union, if you do send testing, the scores can hurt your application. Um, if they're not, if they're lower than what we're typically seeing, I see a handful of applications at least every year um, where we are waitlisting a student who we probably would have admitted if they had not sent the scores because the scores were significantly lower than what we would typically see from, from admitted students. Um, so something to keep in mind. And then the other thing I was going to mention, um, Union, like Trinity, as Emily said, we are test optional, truly test optional. If you do not send them, they do not hurt you. Um, but one way that, that you as a student or a parent can get a little bit more insight to colleges um, as you're talking to them is, you know, look at the test optional percentage that they share and whether it's the percentage of applicants who apply test optional, whether it's the percentage of admitted students or enrolled students that are test optional, because what you will find that is a little bit scary is that there are some schools out there that say they're test optional, but like 95% of their incoming class had testing. And Others on the panel can disagree with me. I don't think that's coincidence. I think if almost all of the students you're admitting or enrolling had testing, you cannot convince me that the testing in and of itself, having it played a role in that process. And that's a, a really good way to be able to tell kind of how they're sharing it. And then to call them out on it, ask them, ask them what that what that number is and, and find out a little bit more um, and be able to get some more insight into that. The only piece, the only other component I'll add to that is some institutions like the last two that I've worked with, we were both test optional. Um, however, we used the test to alleviate students having to take placement exams because we still had the placement exams on campus for math and English. So where the test came into play was student didn't have to sit the, uh, the, the placement exam. They could just submit their scores after the fact. But we changed all of our merit-based scholarships away from the test and just made it simply based upon the student's rigor and their academic uh, profile. So pretty much, yes, we are test optional. Uh, the state is tricky because we are also moved by what happens at Hartford. Uh, so if somebody gets up on the, in front of government 
and says, hey, you know, we need to make sure that the states are doing this. All of a sudden it trickles down into the state, into the educational realm, and we almost have to follow suit. So keep that in mind as well. But in, in regards to the SAT essay, it's not, the SAT doesn't require that students do the essay portion. So I wholeheartedly agree that you need to check with the institutions uh, that, may, that may request or require that exam uh, as to whether or not to me. There's no reason not to do it, to tell the truth. It's not required, but if you're doing the ACTs, then you know it's a, this additional 45 minutes uh, to that test. But uh, so that's just my part. Awesome, and we we just have a few minutes. So um, any any takeaways as especially our juniors start to navigate this process? Any one-liner tips of advice that you would leave them with as we wrap up? I have something that's not really advice or not really like, you know, it, it's something that's been bothering me lately. We have students that will use one email on the application. And then when they correspond with us, they will use another email address. That is not helpful for anybody because we use your email address a lot, even to just find you in our system. So stick with one email address. That's my piece of advice for you and use that email address. Make sure it's an email address that you are going to use. If you're using a school email address, make sure you're checking spam filters and things like that. that that's great advice. And I, would, and I would just remind our students, please make sure it should go without saying that the email address you're communicating with is appropriate. Um, your school email is a guaranteed appropriate email. Um, but I know like my daughter had, you know, unicorns one, two, three that we gave her when she was seven, you know, not the email you should be corresponding with colleges with. So that's, but thank you for that reminder. Cause that's, that is a big deal. Thank you. Any other final thoughts? My, my thought would be plan to maximize the summer as best as you can uh, throughout your college search process, maximize the summer, um, but also get good to get great, get great grades, right? Continue to put your best foot forward. Don't, um, I heard a, a speech the other day from a valedictorian um, last year that was talking about, you know, that, that pursuit to high school graduation and talked about the, um, the disease, senioritis. Um, and I started laughing, and, but he, he, it's he real. was right. It's, he it's was real. right. It was yeah. a piece that you need to make sure that you understand that, you know, senior year comes and all of a sudden it's like, hey, I worked three years hard. I can take the break. Please don't do so. Keep plugging along. Um, how you finish and how we see you is how we want you to finish and we want you to enjoy your college attrition a little bit easier, so. Awesome, thank you. Um, all right, well, this will conclude our fall college panel. I once again wanna give a huge thank you to all of you for joining us and sharing your evening and time away from your families um, and just your expertise. This has been incredibly valuable and I'm so pleased that our students had the opportunity to hear um, from you and to, to benefit from all of your wisdom. So thank you once again um, and everyone should have a good night. Bye-bye everybody. <laughs>